Give us the iteration, the scale, the applications you're most excited about for something like ChatGPT or generative AI. Yeah, I think for ChatGPT specifically, search is probably the thing that gets everyone really excited. Um, on a first order, you can think about how existential that is to Google and how their kind of economic model works. I think as you start to see more and more of these use cases become more um, emergent and more professional ready in, in areas that start off as needing kind of inspiration, move towards needing 90% perfection and eventually make their way all the way to kind of 99 plus. You can think of like legal as an example. Um, and then in, the, in those middle areas, you can think of areas like uh, biology, material discovery, things like that, uh, as well as a bunch of other enterprise software use cases. So mm. we really think this is something that's interesting across a bunch of different industries and is going to uh, cut into a bunch of different companies' kind of supposed moats over time. A lot of hype and actually a lot of hand-wringing around some of the ethics around it all, Michael. Is that developing simultaneously with the innovation? Are you worried about basically the rules, regulations, the steering of the road not being formed quickly enough? Um, I think with all emergent technologies, especially when they get the type of adoption that's been kind of rampant for ChatGPT, you see this concern around can we roll this out properly, which is ironic as OpenAI was originally built around this idea of deploying AI in a kind of safe manner. Um, I, I don't worry about it as much. I think there's a lot of open questions around kind of artist attribution, around um, kind of fair right usage of different types of data, where if you're pulling from a different source, a bunch of different sources, should you need to cite those sources? But in general, I think that the value continually outstrips kind of the, the downsides, and we really should focus on um, the, the optimistic version of these technologies. What, are you surprised, as somebody tracking the space between the time that reports came out, Microsoft was thinking about boosting its investment in OpenAI, and then last night when a blog post comes out talking about how they're going to incorporate the underlying technology into their own platforms, as somebody that knows how these deals work and also what the utility is, what's your read on the news announcements? I think it's just a continual... Um you know, I just continually am impressed by Microsoft over years now. And I think they see the strategic asset that having these kind of foundation models and uh, large language models implemented into their products uh, can be, and also it can allow them to potentially leapfrog competitors. And I think what you're going to see is, um, as we all know, a lot of other large companies that are figuring out what are they going to do. Google is the most notable one on the sideline. I think they have bigger regulatory uh, headwinds. And so they are being very, very careful about this. But I think all of us knew the scale of people there that care about these problems that are um, kind of very interested in figuring out, you know, what are the ways in which we can um, disrupt ourselves and or disrupt our biggest competitors. And for Microsoft, it's always been about disrupting competitors and specifically doing it from the enterprise layer. And I think what we're going to see is that Microsoft's ambitions are going to continue to expand far outside of just enterprise software. And I think that's where people should be maybe less surprised over the next 24 months. Right. Michael, I'm assuming there are some parallels between the experience you're having at the moment, particularly in your inbox and mine and Caroline's, that since this story took off, you know, lots of emails come across about startups working in the field of AI. It's hard to discern and distinguish the, the sort of those players that have genuine promise, those that have something unique about them, that have a, you know, a strong underlying technology or IP. Is that your experience? Are you getting pitches? Are, you, are people seeking investment from you and you're saying, God, I don't know what is real in the world of AI and what's not? Yeah, someone who has spent, you know, the better part of eight years in AI and, and also in similar time, my time in crypto from 2016 on, I'm used to these kind of hype cycles and people <laughs> adding verbiage, whether it's Web3 or now AI, to their, um, you know, to their pitch. I think that you have to kind of understand what are the uh, core special skills or special sauces of these founders and entrepreneurs. Are they product centric? Are they technology centric? Are they distribution centric? And I think really most of these teams are not technology centric and kind of are not at the bleeding edge of machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And if you're not there, then you have to be elite on the product side. And so I think what we're going to see is both a lot of people that pitch AI and never even get there, but also a bunch of people that integrate, you know, open AI APIs or other types of companies APIs and build products that um, take up quite quickly, but are kind of suffering from death by a thousand cuts or yeah. suffering by 
having no real moats in these businesses. I think, as you brought up Google, and I think back to a UK startup, DeepMind, that it first purchased, and the focus that the UK had in artificial intelligence, where in the world are these companies getting built at the moment? Because we seem to be very US-centric about it at this moment in time. I actually think the UK is one of the most interesting places in the world for artificial intelligence today. I think it's the US, it's Canada, and Toronto, and Waterloo, and then the UK. Um, and, and Europe has a few other disparate areas. But the concentration of talent in those places is, is pretty obvious. And I think the best part, really for the UK specifically, we're investors in a company called Wave AI, which is a self-driving company using a very advanced type of machine learning to get their cars to drive themselves. What we're seeing now is a kind of renaissance of these machine learning researchers no longer wanting to be in research or academic settings. And so I think a lot of people in Europe specifically and London specifically were in DeepMind kind of really enjoying publishing these amazing papers, whether it was AlphaFold or a bunch of others. And now they're seeing ChatGPT hit 5 million people in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, you know, it's, it's been cool sitting around and working on technology for the last few years, but it's time yeah. to go and build.